All right, we are live on Facebook. So those of you who have your Facebook uh, account available and another device, you can go over to uh, the social justice advocacy page, find the live feed that we have going in the group, share that to your page, and that allows your friends to see our uh, conversation here tonight. Uh, we'll keep that open until we go to our breakout groups and then we close down the, uh, the Facebook share at that time so that our time in breakout groups is not uh, public, but we get to you know have a little bit of community time, some family time where you can share uh, what your journey has been uh, in allyship this week or two weeks, if you may have missed some time. But we'll get kicked off here tonight as we wrap up our series, our four-part series that we've been uh, working through. Uh, we'll do some recap and then talk about what's coming next. So we're really excited about some of the plans that we have uh, in the works in the very near future. Uh, Operation Ally has been a tremendous uh, success and continues to be a tremendous success and we look forward to uh, taking the next steps with the group so really excited we'll get started here in uh, just a minute or two once again if you have the opportunity go to your Facebook page look up the social justice advocacy page share this live onto your Facebook so that uh, your friends your family get the opportunity to uh, learn alongside of you All right, Thomas, you about ready to hand it off? Get us kicked off officially? You're on mute. That's why you can't hear me. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I wanna first start today by uh, recognizing um, the work um, and the legacy of the Honorable uh, John Lewis. Uh, we, uh, well, I observed uh, his memorial service today. Um, you know, it was a beautiful service. Um, and I think it reminded us, uh, reminded me of just how long of a struggle this has been, but at the same time, it ain't that long because uh, he literally, uh, it was in his lifetime, right? So he marched with Dr. King, he observed uh, Dr. King's advocacy and, you know, was a pivotal, played a pivotal role in the civil rights movement. And in fact, I think he was rightly uh, recognized as uh, what Barack Obama called him as the founding, one of the founding fathers of uh, the new America um, as it has been transformed after it is as um, blatant racial oppression. So, uh, and that, that's Jim Crow. So that, that is something I want to recognize, um, it, you know, is uh, his profound work on who we are and where we've come as a nation. Um, and on that, this particular day, I think I'd be remiss um, not to recognize him um, and to at least uh, start our program with recognition of his uh, life legacy and service um, since today was the day that we uh, recognize him for that. That being said, um, I hope you guys had a great week. We are here to complete uh, section four of our four-part series. So this is the last session of this particular series, but uh, the show goes on. We will be uh, furthering the discussion. We're going to be talking about our overall vision and plan for what we hope the long-term steps are in developing 
uh, solutions to the problems that we are uh, we've been discussing, we've been researching, we've been exposing ourselves to. So um, the goal is that all of this will not be just for um, personal knowledge that you take in and you know you deal with among yourself, but also something that you um, take back or we develop community around and develop uh, discussions around um, so that we can actually figure out a way to uh, develop the cross-cultural communications and relationships that I think are necessary to get the social appreciation we need. Um, and so that, that's really gonna be what uh, much of our discussion is gonna be about um, here uh, this evening. Um, if there are no issues, I'm trying to go ahead and, there we go. Jason, anything before we get started? Nope. I'm good, right. unless anybody's interested in the fact that my baby girl's three weeks old this week, today. <laughs> Always get a few. Hey, she's, for... she's lived with you for three weeks and hasn't run yet. She's doing good. She's yeah, doing good. yeah. She's, she's cried a bit, but she hasn't ran away. <laughs> All right, so this is a, 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 the overview of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we will hope to have some pretty purposeful breakout rooms at the end of the session. As like I said, we begin to um, embark on what I think is gonna be the more uh, solidified role of this group. Um, so uh, Michelle, if you could, uh, I believe you're, oh yeah, you are, there you go. If you could uh, take us through some breath work to get us started. Cool, Hello, everybody. All right, so you can stand or sit, and we'll start off with some shaking of your hands and our wrists. Yes, wiggle it out, do any kind of natural movement. You can roll the shoulders, you can roll the neck, you can move the hips, mm. your legs. See if you can intuitively feel what the body needs right now. Even if you can't do anything about it, just a little body scan and an assessment and then when you're ready you can find a place of stillness and do what is natural to you so notice what you naturally did with your hands and notice the natural state of your breath right now last week we tapped into the sensation of feeling and hearing. And so you might use that as a lens to notice the natural state of your breathing in this moment, which is directly influenced by how your day's been going. So we're not gonna change our breath just yet. We're simply going to be the observer and the witness of your breath. And many times when you come into this seat of stillness, simply observing will actually start to alter your breath in a way that the body needs you to. So watch how your breath is moving, maybe your chest, your ribs, your belly. hear what your breath sounds like. You might even close a little flap against your ears. So you might notice in just those few moments, your breath started to smooth out a little bit or lengthen. And today we'll practice box breathing, which is a very powerful breath that you can tap into at any time. And what we'll do is we'll actually add a pause to your inhale and your exhale. Now, if at any moment you feel uncomfortable doing this, or if it causes any form of anxiety, please return to simply observing your breath. But right now, empty all of your air out. And then notice that little pause at the bottom that naturally happens and then breathe deeply in through your nose. 
When you finish your breath, notice the pause at the top and exhale out. Let's extend the pause at the bottom for one, two, inhale in. Hold it at the top for one, two, exhale out. Maybe extend it even longer for one, two, three. Inhale in. Hold it at the top for one, two, three. Exhale out. Maybe for one, two, three, four. Inhale in for one, two, three, four. Hold for one, two, three, four. Exhale for one, two, three, four. Hold for one, two, three, four. Inhale, one, two, three, four. We'll do two more rounds and do it at your own pace. If that's too long or too quick, you can slow it down, you can lengthen, but I want you to imagine a box and follow the edges of the block, of the box. Let's do one more round. As you inhale, you go up the box. As you hold, you go across the box. As you exhale, you go down the other side. And then you hold as you go across the bottom. And go ahead and return to a more natural state of breathing. And simply notice the shifts, the awareness, And take a moment today and perhaps we can honor all of those who have come before us and who have fought this fight for social justice. Just a moment of silence. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was just in a conference yesterday and uh, we were talking about health and wellness um, or, or uh, health and its relationship to our uh, financial wealth. And the speaker is a uh, nationally known health uh, and fitness guru. And he talked about box breathing and its efficacy for um, our overall well-being and it's actually taught to Navy SEALs and police officers as part of the training to calm themselves in the midst of uh, very you know tense situations that they're found in uh, so as we started the breathing I was like we should do some box breathing and then you went right to it so that was awesome and you know guys know that this is not just something we do because we you know, we need some something to fill time. We all know that Thomas can fill time with another slide and some more uh, legal notes if he needs to. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is something we do because it's for our overall health, overall well-being, and uh, does a great job to center us before we get into uh, what is some very serious information that we need to take in. Absolutely. Am I on mute? No, you're good. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, thank you. I, uh, everybody knows I can fill space. So that being said, <laughs> let me fill some space. All right. So um, like I said, we're on part three of our four parts or part four of our four part series. Um, a little recap of what it is that we've talked about uh, so far. Like, so where, where should we be in the thinking? Um, we've discussed the racialization or the moralization of space, right? Uh, first, it was Christian versus non-Christian. Then it's white versus non-white. 
right? We classify something as civil and things that are not considered uh, that particular thing are not civil, right? Um, if you are Christian, then you are civil. If you are not Christian, then you are not civil. If you are white, then you are civil. If you are not white, then you are not civil. It was the same logic that led to the subjugation of first, uh, the indigenous Native Americans here in the United States. And then secondly, Africans, once uh, the indigenous Native Americans found themselves, well, they were an unreliable source because they one, fought back, um, two, knew the land a little bit better, and three, died a lot of time from uh, smallpox, right? And there, the, the shortage of white indentured servants uh, created the demand for Africans and the way that they ended up, uh, well, not Africans, but non-white, and the way that they ended up getting uh, this sort of relationship to be okay was by considering whiteness civilized and non-white not civilized and therefore Africans foreigners were considered non-civilized savages and therefore working with and for the white man was their key and form of civilizing themselves among white society. Um, and so that's where you see, when you think about like, what is whiteness? What is white supremacy? Well, white supremacy is the structure, is the process, right? I mean, as a lawyer, I can even say it's, it's probably, well, I know it's embedded in the legal process in that uh, you have this one piece of law that was codified and through the British empire, it was spread all throughout the, uh, all throughout the globe, right? So even America, even though we pledge uh, we won our independence, we fought for our independence, and then, you know, we started uh, the United States of America, we were still bound by British uh, common law, right? So that white supremacy found itself in Europe, but it spread throughout because of the span of the British Empire. And as countries started to fight for independence, you start to see that shape take on a different shape, right? So they had to figure out a way to justify that subjugation, that, that second tier class status, and the way they did it was civilized versus non-civilized. And then- and Thomas, sure. if, if I can just uh, interject briefly on that, uh, what one thing I want you all to do is that, that first thought there of civilizing versus non-civilizing, as we start weaving all this together and recapping it and coming to the end of uh, criminal, listen to how the language um, begins to shift because it, it, it's no longer appropriate to call somebody uncivilized and how it, when you start looking at your social interactions with people, um, those, you know, they're acting like animals. Well, that, isn't this just another way to say civilized versus uncivilized? Um, and a lot of the language that people choose to use, this is where we get the idea of dog whistle politics, right? That what's being said may not be inherently racist, but it is built on a racist um, subtext to it. And so just keep that in mind as we're going through this kind of recap of, of what we've covered and how the language changes or the mechanism for identifying what is good versus bad changes. But at the end of the day, we're still pointing at the same group as the bad, unacceptable, uncivilized. Uh, Jason, that that I think is a very salient point. Like we're talking about, you know, this in history, but it has a definite connection to status quo and how we relate to one another, right? So even if it's not animals, it's stuff like super predators, right? Or yep. uh, these labels that we uh, we slap on people that if you were human, you would not be this particular thing, right? A predator you use in terms of uh, animalistic quality. Right, so, um, and that's just something that we saw in the 90s, um, but you're, you're absolutely right. It connects literally to present day that that language piece uh, still plays the same function. Um, and then we see here, we talked about the economic impact of real estate. So it's not just that real estate in and of itself is valuable, it's that this system has been constructed in such a way to make real estate valuable. And because of slavery, the apartheid, the American apartheid, uh, racial covenants, and then uh, city planning, uh, income and wage discrimination and housing price discrimination, we ended up seeing that the system not only prefers real estate, but it kept minorities or non-whites away from real estate 
and allow white individuals to have access to real estate, sometimes in many cases for free, right? So it gave away real estate, made it valuable, excluded others from that same real estate, and then put a value and price around it that makes it economically viable where you can send your kids to college, you can pay for uh, housing, you can pay it for a down payment for the first, uh, your kid's first home, you pass on this wealth intergenerationally. Um, and this has been something that many minorities have been systemically uh, excluded from. Right, and it's also remember, uh, real estate is one of the most tax favored uh, growth opportunities from a transfer standpoint, from a wealth transfer standpoint, real estate is, is most almost the, I would probably say the most tax favored uh, way to transfer wealth to the next generation. So uh, again, it just exponential uh, effect. And when you th see things like, let's keep down property taxes, let's keep down the, all of these different home ownership issues. And you even, again, here's a language, homeowner, uh, pride of ownership. This home shows pride of ownership because you know, those renters, those type of people, they don't take care of their things. And it, it just integrates through all of our language. Right. Um, moving on, we talked about labor, economics, how the entire economic system is built on a second, on the existence, or it's predicated on the existence of a second class citizen. Um, we started that with slavery, then we shifted into a system of convict leasing. Um, I do not have sharecropping up here, forgive me. But uh, remember, sharecropping was the system of uh, Black individuals or uh, poor individuals moving into the land, growing the land, and then growing the product, and then having to give up all the product and then pay uh, exploitative fees, uh, which oftentimes resulted in bankruptcy or them losing access to the land in the first place. Okay, so uh, we see a, a smooth transition from slavery from convict leasing to sharecropping. And then now in the 1970s, we've seen an explosion in incarceration in the United States where, uh, and I know you're familiar with this statistic, we are 5% of the world's population yet house 25% of the world's uh, incarcerated. Um, it's a bit paradoxical. Um, the land of the free, home of the brave have the largest incarceration rates. I also think it's paradoxical to say we are the land of the free, yet we're also the law and order country, right? What does law and order mean when you're talking about a free society? I, I, I need that reconciliation, that clarification. If anybody have it, I'd be open to have that discussion. But as far as I'm concerned, law and order is being used as a tool against a particular people. And the land of the free is a context that has been used for a different class of people and, and as we've talked about, Dr. King talked about it in two different Americas, W.B. Du Bois talked about it in uh, double consciousness and uh, Kendi talks about it as far as dual consciousness. So there's, there's a two-ness that has taken place throughout uh, really our um, existences, at least as far as mod our modern existence is concerned that we are trying to address here. And that has a lot to do with white supremacy. Actually, it is white supremacy. Um, and then finally, we talked a little bit about gerrymandering, right? Uh, how if you pocket particular voices in particular areas, then you can cut up those areas and dilute their voices while uh, collecting uh, white voices in particular areas to maintain uh, the political body as a white political body. And I, I shared the quote from the, um, on the Senate floor, the debate where it was pledged by a state senator that California would uh, now and forever be a white state, right? Just as it was argued uh, on the federal level that the United States will now and forever be a white country. Um, we did start talking about gerrymandering, but we're gonna expand this conversation next week um, into a broader context of how this has worked out, you know, as far as the, from the three fits compromise or from the three-fifths uh, classification to uh, literacy uh, uh, tests, poll taxing, um, and then ID laws, uh, and then how all of that plays into mass incarceration kind of culminates into um, what I think uh, really matters, and that is keeping this a white country. 
right? If we dilute the voices, the political voices of minorities, then you maintain um, a white body politic and that results in white policies that perpetuate white supremacy. And then so do you understand, I guess the broader connection that I see in all of this is uh, uh, the identity, how all of this uh, results in our identity, right? The uh, racialization of space, the moralization of space has resulted in um, a denial of certain aspects of identity for non-white individuals. And the solution ultimately is opening up those spaces so that individuals who've been really for, I guess we fall for integration, but a lot of us are forced into integration, right? Have an opportunity to actually perform and participate in the society around them, thus enhancing their uh, natural humanistic uh, characteristics and qualities. Any questions or anything on the recap? I would just add to something on the integration piece. Uh, Kendi does a good job of, and that's the, the author of uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, Kendi does a really good job of talking about how with integration, the idea was always that black people would integrate into white spaces and never, because that would be elevating and civilizing and enhancing that group. Uh, there was never a, a thought process that white people could also integrate into black space and understand new culture and grow and develop from that. Uh, so even integration was done in such a way that it superseded or, or um, exalted the white space over the black space rather than saying these two spaces both have their mutual value and we don't want them to we don't want them to require be required to be mutually exclusive of one another but let's learn to value them together and enjoy them together absolutely um so this is uh basically kind of going to open up the discussion to what we're talking about tonight and that is uh the incarceration rates um just to kind of give you a uh a scale or a spectrum of where the United States is internationally on its um, scale of incarceration, right? This is, I mean, you have El Salvador, you have Rwanda, Russia, Brazil. I mean, you would hardly consider these countries to be the beacons of freedom and democracy, right? Um, and for us to have it codified in our constitution, we have to ask ourselves like, what's, what, what's going on here? Right. And even if even if, say, you can blame it on the individual. Right. What is it about the United States that has individuals unable to keep themselves out of incarceration if you're able to blame it on the individual compared to other countries? Look at the uh, countries that aren't on here. Why isn't Ecuador or uh, Ecuador up there? Right. Or uh, where's Mexico? Why isn't Mexico up there, for goodness sakes? Right. Like you see some bad countries. Right. Some. Uh, uh, North Korea is not even up there. Where the freak is North Korea, right? Like this, this tells you how dire of a circumstance we're in when literally uh, we tout ourselves as a free nation, yet we show ourselves to one, breed individuals who are incapable of antisocial behavior or two, just so happen to coincidentally have a bunch of policies that screw people and uh, set themselves up to be incarcerated. And then the question then becomes, why would we want incarceration, right? So whether you take yeah. the position of blaming the person, the individual for their incarceration or the policies for their incarceration, either way, you have to ask yourself, what is it about the United States and the people of the United States that, bleed, that breed such uh, incarcerated disparities? Something, something I find interesting to note uh, in this uh, slide as well, and I'm not sure if there was some, I, I'm sure there was some quali qualifying standards for a country to be on this slide, but if you notice, outside of Rwanda, uh, I don't see any African countries on here. And if the, the people, there's something wrong culturally with these people, well, I, I don't see any African countries with these high incarceration rates. Um, I also don't see 
very many other large countries, Germany, they're not, uh, they're pretty low on the list. Uh, you know, uh, looking at countries with high density of, of people, India, very, very low on the list. So I hear oftentimes, well, you can't, con you can't compare us to a country like, uh, you know, Sweden or uh, Denmark, you know, because they're so small. Well, Germany is a pretty large country. India has a lot of people in it. And we're still massively out or underperforming them in the ability to breed citizens or, or create a system for citizens to remain out of, out of prison. And in my background, part of what I've done is uh, operations management for a, a distribution company. And the thing that was always in our mind when we were looking at problems and there was errors uh, in our output is the system is perfectly designed to give you the output you're receiving. So when we look at America, the American criminal justice system is perfectly designed for this output that we're, we're receiving. And if we don't like our output, we need to change the system. So uh, just some things to think about contextually and conversationally with people is when people say, well, yeah, look at, you know, how many of those people are going to prison? Well, our system is designed to do that because that's what systems do is they give you the output. Uh, so let's evaluate that as a whole and not just look at isolated incidents. Right. And, and that's really the point that I was trying to make in, connect, in comparison to other countries. Right. We talk about the, the Mexican government doesn't have a solidified legal structure. Right. Like these are stereotypes that we cast on other countries. Yet when you talk about the outcomes and the products, it appears that we seem more consistent with the stereotypes that we're casting on other countries than what we claim ourselves to be. Right. And so that's the point that I'm making is especially like in, in I mean, I read an article the other day, like black people feel uh, afraid of Africa. Right. And quite honestly, up until I joined the debate team and started doing uh, research and actually start meeting other Africans, I had that same fear, right? So I think it's about practicing what it is we're preaching. And so when we start talking about where do we place the blame, it, the point is it doesn't matter where you wanna place the blame, we need to come up with a solution, right? Um, and so like we, we talk about this in the three different contexts, the racial disparities, the private prisons and then uh, the prison labor. Ultimately, um, this is the interesting discussion that I think is worth teasing out because what is the solution, okay? Um, I, I, I mean, even in uh, say ideal countries that have uh, good conditions for those who they incarcerate and have uh, rehabilitation, um, these are still systems that, you know, bad, you know, people who are doing bad things or whatever, they, they still need to punish them. So what does that look like in our society, right? We need to start thinking about that um, more. But to get in some of the racial dis uh, disparities, right, um, and that, that's uh, Liz makes the point, uh, they are rehabilitative, right? So what does that look like in the United States? Okay, like if it's if they base their rehabilitation with the max sentence of 14 years, I mean, are we just afraid? Are we too afraid to even think about that? Um, why is it that there is such a disparity? And I think we're going to talk about that. Some of the motivations that we currently have in our system that sets up this uh, this system, right? But we see that one in three black boys will uh, can expect to go to prison, as opposed to one in six. Uh, Latino boys and one in 17 uh, white boys, okay? Um, African-Americans are incarcerated in state prisons across the country, five times the rate of whites. And actually, if you look at the current trend, you see white incarceration is going down, African-American incarceration is going up. Where um, previously, there has always been the argument that numerically, there's still, white men are still the highest New number of incarcerated individuals. However, because of that number going down and the uh, incarceration of black men going up, we're starting to find that even though black men are only 6% of, uh, of the population, like we make up a significant part 
of those who are currently incarcerated. Um, and that it's not even just about black men, it's also about black women. Okay, so when you think about the, again, the, the racialization of space, the moralization of space, the white versus non-white dichotomy, if things were equal, because statistically we're gonna see that um, we commit crimes at about the same rate, um, is it here? Well, we're gonna see that we commit crimes at about the same rate. Uh, why is there such a vast disparity between white and non-white individuals? Um, and th these are a, a few um, statistics that we have to further uh, make up our point. If you've watched 13th, if you've read the new Jim Crow, um, then you should be caught up on really a lot of this stuff. But, but we're not just talking about um, the, 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 uh, the disparity in adults. We're talking about it being in uh, our juveniles. We're talking about what that means for the school to prison pipeline. We uh, covered last week that minorities are um, disciplined far at far greater levels than uh, white children in schools. Um, and now we're starting to see exactly the same disparities here in our mass incarceration trend. Um, the, here's again our youth. Um, you can see that uh, we're just higher across the board, right? So that, that same Jim Crow, that same apartheid system that we're talking about was undone uh, after the civil rights movement. Um, it's not, we're, we're not talking about that being undone. We're talking about those trends still continuing um, to, to, through 2000 uh, and then 2018, right? So even if you get the number down, we're still uh, disproportionately represented in youth incarceration. Thomas, quick question for you. Sure. Uh, you talked about that trend line, those trend lines of uh, black male and white male incarceration beginning to shift. When did we sh see that shift start happening? Um, actually, I think it was probably around 2012 where you started to see it go down, uh, and it was around the realignment. So the, the California Supreme Court says uh, you guys need to reduce your prison population, so they had to release a bunch of people, and you start to see the white uh, male population go down while the white uh, or the black male population continue to trend upward. So a, benef a beneficial policy to improve, uh, you know, how many people we have in prison is disproportionately administered to the white community's benefit. Well, even when we talk about rehabilitation services, statistics show that uh, white individuals and black individuals have the same exact success rate in housing programs yet white individuals outnumber black individuals, I think nine to one in receiving uh, uh, access to housing resources. And that's here in the San Gabriel Valley or uh, LA County, right? So, you know, it's, it's not even just, you know, some of the services that are available, but it's also even housing. Another uh, correlation that I found, I'm still waiting to tease out if there's an actual, uh, if it's causation, but um, with, incar uh, with the realignment, with people being released from jail, we saw an increase in homelessness, right? Uh, but we see racial disparities in that increase in homelessness. And then what compounds all of that is a significant portion of our arrests are of homeless people, right? Which means you have people that are being released in jail, right? They are racially uh, disproportionately minority, and then those people are rearrested in the system so they continue to make up that cycle of recidivism that continues to perpetuate and propagate the system. That makes sense? Yep. All right. Um, and so we see some 
things that have been done, right? Delaware made it, uh, remove the geographic based enhancements, as you can see, or uh, you may or may not be aware, but if you get caught with say guns or drugs within particular areas, maybe within a particular uh, feet of the park or school or something like that, then they enhance your sentence. Well, this impacts disproportionately uh, minority defendants who find themselves uh, facing these enhancements uh, at a much higher rate. Um, California's uh, Senate Bill uh, 136 repealed the one-year sentence enhancement for each prior prison or felony term. So basically, if you got busted again, even though you have previously paid your full debt to society, supposedly, they would tack on a year uh, in, in, in future occurrences. Um, that was repealed. Um, and then uh, you saw um, uh, AB 1211, that would have paved the way for inmate firefighters to uh, be hireable after release, but that, that died on the desk. Basically, that's an issue of policymaking, where if you are the majority leader or whatever, you get to decide what gets to go up for vote. Um, and it just basically wasn't taken up for a vote, right? So these are some potential solutions that we've seen come up um, to try and equalize uh, the time and the disparities that exist racially. Um, private prisons, uh, this is all an issue to me. Um, basically, uh, the mass incarceration created a, uh, a tough on crime policies. We saw the drug, um, the drug war announced by Nixon, and we saw that expanded under the Reagan administration. And so this created a lucrative business opportunity for folks to get government contracts um, to provide uh, prison services, okay? So they basically agreed to provide incarcerated people with the mandatory ration of food, clothing, healthcare, and their living needs in exchange for funding, right? And I just wanna, I want you to just think about this for a second because um, I've owned a business for nine years and you know, business is hard, but if I can create a relationship with the government where they can go out and arrest the people that would ultimately be my customers or my funding base, could you imagine how rich I could be? Could you imagine how rich any of us could be, right? That's literally the structure of the private prison system where you get into a relationship with the government for them to go out and arrest people for you to house and then to make money off of. Right, and then you turn around and you pay money for various politicians to take up seats in government that are gonna to be tough on crime so that you increase the amount of beds and the amount of people in those spaces, which only increases your the amount of time that you, uh, or the amount of money that you receive. And so we've seen all across the nation where judges are literally given disproportionately high jail and prison sentences to minors in exchange for kickbacks and campaign donations from the owners of these prisons, these private prisons. Okay, so to me, I think it's inherently uh, morally questionable. Talk about the perception of impropriety. You're talking about the profit motive be linked directly to our freedom. And that, that to me just doesn't make sense in a free society. And so some of the issues that we uh, start to see because of that profit motive, um, overcrowding, right? Uh, you see infectious disease are higher concentrated at corrections facilities. We're seeing that now uh, with COVID, okay? But 15% uh, of jail inmates and 22% of prisoners compared to just 5% of the prison population have some of these diseases, okay? Um, and then the five most known clusters of uh, COVID-19 virus are within correct facilities. Okay, so even though they are taking on the responsibility of maintaining uh, these prisons, they're not actually fulfilling the role of keeping them safe, but they're making tons of profit. And, and, and here's the thing, my point isn't that we should make everything comfortable for people who break law. Uh, my point is that we have a system that creates people to break laws and then um, punish, I mean, use exploits them in the process. So, um, 
That's Thomas, if I could issues. break in here, you know, just a second to kind of, this is where we can tease out what Liz dropped into the, uh, the chat earlier is, is there an alternate way to do prison? And we have a punishment based system versus a reform based system or a rehabilitation based system. But as Thomas uh, alluded to, our system isn't built to uh, value that because our system isn't built with the idea that people going into prison and coming out of prison in a short period of time not to return in the future is not a value. The value is in keeping as many people there as long as possible so that we can have this new form of slavery through paying people minuscule wages to do the work that, well, I know th those are a couple of slides. I jumped, I jumped a couple of slides ahead. Sorry, I, I previewed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, even at its base, the structure of the prison is such that the more bodies are in the beds, the more the owners of the prison get paid. And this is the part that just blew my mind when I when I learned it, that, oh, these these buildings are not just put up by the government and done one time. There you go. This is the, the maintenance of this is on the government's responsibility. This is a company that is literally profiting from the existence of crime. Why do we set that? Well, a, a private company, a, a particular individual or set of individuals and stakeholders, why is it built into our system that people profit the more crime is out there? In, in uh, the insurance world, they would call that a moral hazard. It's morally wrong to do that type of thing where you create a profit for negative outcome. Yet that's exactly what our prison system is. Uh, so it, that's the, the answer to why in America we have no desire to create a rehabilitation-based system. We have a criminal punishment system, not a criminal justice system or a criminal rehabilitation system. Um, how do they not fall under conflicts of interest? Uh, that's a good question for the attorney. Uh, that's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who asked everything, that question? Was that Heather? Did you, did that you just stump Thomas? Huh? Everything, just everything, stump you? everything that I've read makes it a conflict of interest to me. But um, I don't know. There, there's a lot of hypocrisy in the system. And that, that to me, um, is, is at the root of the issue right, is that we do have that conflict of interest where we, uh, we want to see people incarcerated in order to regain that profit. Um, but I mean, the question then becomes, is, it, is there an inherent evil in the government not incarcerating people, right? Because I, I'm also a, a, a believer that the government is not the best actor in all circumstances, right? So California says, um, we're going to ban uh, private prisons but if you provide these particular benefits, then we'll allow it, right? And so is the solution getting rid of all private prisons or is the solution creating a mechanism where we say you can be private, but you must provide these things? I still, I'm with Heather still. I gotta, I gotta say it, there's an inherent conflict that appears to be present here that even allowing the private prison in the first place, even with the best of intentions, that profit motive means that I need bodies, right? And so I have zero interest in seeing rehabilitation take place outside of prison. I have zero interest in seeing people rehabilitated in their communities, with their families, with the people who love them, which just so happens to be the most effective form of rehabilitation. So. Um, I, I do think it creates an inherent conflict of interest. Oh, definitely, uh, Angie. You're, is it, yeah, you're talking about some of the wealthiest uh, corporations um, 
that make money off of these prison situations, but actually let's talk about it, right? Um, the value, estimated value of prison labor uh, output is about $2 billion. Okay, so we're talking about significant funds that are being made off of the labor as a, at a profit. Um, Texas does not require their inmates to get paid a uh, minimum wage as many of the other states and their labor system is uh, estimated to be almost worth a hundred million dollars. Um, what is interesting though, is that federal law does require that they get paid minimum wage, but the state may garnish these wages to cover the cost of incarceration, right? And the other thing to consider is where federal minimum wage is, right? It is so low. And I was taught as a boy growing up, well, I was taught if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. But if a person doesn't work, he doesn't eat, right? So just because you've done something to be incarcerated doesn't exactly uh, get rid of your obligation to contribute in order to eat. Completely get it, completely understand the logic and the value in that. However, again, because of the profit system, we have situations where people are being set up to be there just to fill that role. And that therein lies the problem. Right, where we can get a lot of the same benefits with them outside rather than inside. You're breaking up families, you're breaking up homes, you're breaking up economies and communities uh, in this system. And that, that makes this inherently problematic, even if you have more altruistic and better uh, morals, for instance, um, taking it. Um, one of the things to note is prison labor for the MA firefighters, okay? Uh, 30 to 40% of firefighters in California on the front lines are uh, prisoners. They get paid about a dollar an hour for their work, um, even though they're doing the work side by side to current crew members, right? I get it. They're firefighters. Uh, they've done absolutely nothing to deserve imprisonment. These prisoners are paying their debt to society. Fine. I get it. Um, but Look at this. This here shows the exact relationship between imprisoning individuals and meeting the state's needs for labor. Okay, when we're talking about uh, getting or the two for one credits, it was argued in court by somebody on Kamala Harris's defense, not linking this to her, but um, from that office, you argued that extending the two for one credits to all minimum custody inmates at this time would severely impact fire camp participation. A dangerous outcome while California is in the middle of a difficult fire season and severe drought, right? So it's not that these people don't deserve to be incarcerated or shouldn't or should be incarcerated. It's because of the impact that fighting the fires are having the reason why we should keep them behind bars. That in and of itself makes it a problem. And it, the problem is compounded because when individuals get out of prison, it's not like they can apply to become firefighters, right? So everything that they've learned, everything that they've contributed above and beyond what is actually necessary to pay their, their debt back to society, they don't even get to use for their benefit out in the market, right? And so th there's, there's a few issues that we have with the current system that I think perpetuates the, current, the problems that we see. A oh, two for one credit is if, as long as you're being good in prison, uh, you get two days credit for every one day that you're in, right? So if you are uh, sentenced to six months um, and you get your two for one, then you'll be done in, in three. Um, but if you know anything about the system, uh, if you get something for six months, they'll probably kick you out that night. Um, and so this actually helps us kind of understand, at least in a snapshot, how uh, various regions and uh, rural areas, their economies are actually made up and perpetuated by um, the prison, by prison labor, right? There's Marin County, 40% um, of fires in California are fought by prison inmates. $80 million were saved per year using prison inmates as opposed to firefighters, right? So it's also about the money that we, we save uh, in the process. Um, and that's what this graphic here shows. As always, uh, this will be out in the follow-up email. Actually, I think it'll be out in the follow-up email. I was told to stop promising things because I don't actually do them. So um, mother, uh, wifey, if it's okay, uh, I'm gonna promise that these graphics are sent out in the email.
You can see I'm, I'm well trained. I guess I'll say disciplined. You're absolutely right. Uh, Fred makes a good point that we don't have the resources to do it, right? Um, and that therein lies the inherency of the issue. Um, I believe it was Tom Cotton made the statement here recently that slavery is a necessary evil, right? This is the kind of point that he's making. Without that second class subjugation, our economy could not exist the way that it does, right? Um, and, and, and that, uh, ends up being why we can get to a point of uh, abolishing slavery, but at the same time, we still need convict leasing, right? We can get rid of convict leasing, but we still need sharecropping. We can get rid of sharecropping, but we still need mass incarceration. One system needs to replace another one because the market, the economy is predicated on that. And, and I don't disagree with the sentiment but I would disagree with the, uh, the ideology that we've bought into. Because the reality is, it's not that we don't have the resources, it's we've chosen not to allocate the resources there. And I, and I know you, you agree with that, Fred, uh, but the, the reality is there is billions, there are billions of dollars in our system that if properly allocated could resolve many of these problems, but they're lining the coffers of individual politicians, of political groups, of um, all of these different places where money just seems to filter into over and over again. You know, when, when you want to find problems with systems, look for, look for where the money's flowing, right? And uh, we continue to throw good money after, after bad and let it, the system perpetuate itself to, to the point where on the surface, people will buy into this idea that, well, you know, we just don't have the resources. We, and if we're going to uh, take resources from anyone, let's take resources from those criminals, those animals, those uncivilized people, because they're the least worthy. And uh, when, when you look at how we think about and treat our criminals. I mean, I see it constantly in conversations with people. Well, if you don't want to do the time, then don't do the crime, right? And that becomes a blanket statement that you can use, uh, you know, play stupid games, get stupid rewards, uh, or get stupid prizes, right? And that you, that's a constant refrain that people can use to just dismiss the humanity of an individual who a system has been size, seismically uh, built to hold down. And uh, these are just realities that we have to be ready to combat and say, no, that e they're still human. And a crime that we put people in prison for is not worthy of stripping somebody's humanity of. Um, yeah. That's my soapbox. I'll get off of it now. Yeah, actually, um, Liz it made a, a, an appropriate observation about the drug, many of these being drug crimes. I mean, especially you talk about the fact that marijuana, that, that is the big paradox that uh, several organizations are working to um, undo it. Brian mentions that these are budget justifications of oppression. Exactly. Um, so uh, when you talk about revisioning, that's where the budget becomes the target of a lot of advocacy groups because the, the budget, um, I mean, in the Bible, it talks about where a man's money is, that's where his uh, heart is also, right? Um, and we all know this to be true in our capitalistic America. Right, so if your money is going to that particular place, that means you actually care about that thing. And so we're at about 6.30. Um, the goal was to kind of bridge that gap to, to understand um, why exactly white supremacy is defined as it is, why we are calling it what it is, and some potential solutions for it. Um, the biggest question that I've been asked time and time again um, all of the talks that I've done is at the end, what is a solution? 
I don't know what the solution is, right? I know how we get to the solution mm -hmm. and that is us developing community. That's us developing relationship and having discussions and actually getting to the point, the heart of the problem, understanding each other and how our current policies impact different groups, right? So I do understand that that is a mechanism to get to the problem, but the community is gonna to have to decide and define what that solution is. And so what we're interested in is having all of this work culminate into a, a policy conference, okay? A cross-cultural policy conference where we are uh, taking some of the, the stuff that we've learned over this process, this evolution that we've all been on together. We are putting those uh, lessons together in a meaningful way. And we are engaged in dialogue, in exchange, in a structured, facilitated uh, uh, process with the hope of establishing some real policy solutions um, to what the issues are that we're facing. So that is what we're hoping all of this uh, culminates into. We've been on this road before. Um, the Social Justice Advocacy Project started uh, because of Michael Brown um, and then, you know, Philando Castile and all the, the hashtags expelled our work, or not expelled our work, um, propelled our work, right? But now we're at, we're, we're at the same place again where I'm, I'm going back and I'm reading some of the same literature and it equally applies today as it did then. So how do we stop ourselves from reiterating or uh, repeating the same cycle that we are on the road to repeating? And so that's what this policy conference is going to be set up for, is for us to engage one another to put down our, our, our barriers, our, our defenses, um, our defense mechanisms, and just engage in pure authentic dialogue with the sole purpose of coming up with a more just equal society from a policy perspective. Um, and so like, that's, that's really, Jason, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, didn't, I thought you were done there. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, you know, because people will ask that, and like Thomas said, well, what's the solution? What's the solution? And it, it, they almost use it, well, they don't almost, they use it as a way to distance themselves or keep at arm's length jumping into this because, well, I don't know where you guys are going with this whole thing, so I don't want to jump in and lend my voice, lend my social capital to something if I don't know what your ends are. And... Well, the ends is equity and justice and asking America to, live, to deliver on her promise of freedom and justice for all. That's, what, that's where we're going. That, um, but well, how do we get there? What's the solution? And the, a, a fair response to that is, listen, if you understand this, this problem is multifaceted and evolved over centuries and generations. So to say that I can give you the, the golden ticket, one, you know, one plan solution is, is impossible to do. But what I can tell you is we're going to begin to peel back the onion on this and pull away the power structures from this piece by piece and dismantle. But we're wise enough to recognize that just like in the past, when you dismantled slavery, you had erected, uh, you know, the convict leasing laws, we're going to have to pull back the for-profit prison system and properly correct that system. Once that's corrected, we can pull back the health care issues and properly correct that issue. The, the problem is too large to tackle all at one time, and that's why there's so many groups doing different pieces of it, but we're going to look at how do we dismantle one piece at a time uh, because we don't get to just walk into you know every governmental office and say we're blowing this whole thing up and starting all over again from scratch today it's going to take a systematic approach of being willing to improve one portion of the system at a time and I, i've said that over and over again we have to be okay with incremental change i said that a lot about the individuals that were we're trying to have social engagement with and open people's hearts to the opportunity that maybe they'll be uh, more present in conversations of racial disparity, but we need to think of the same type of action plan on a systematic standpoint that 
incremental changes within the system continue to get us along, get us further along in the process. Um, so, you know, that's a long winded answer to someone when they say, you know, well, what's your solution? How do you fix it? We're going to take down one system at a time might be the easiest way to say it. And here's the first step to taking down the criminal justice, the problems within the criminal justice system. This is the law. This is the policy uh, that I'm either pushing forward or trying to get off of the books. And, you know, that, those are the types of things that we want to present at the, the policy conference, as I understand it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, right. Exactly, Fred. Uh, we want no more band-aid over the bullet wound. So what we're going to do is uh, break up. Um, here's what we want to talk about. Um, last week, you had uh, some reflections that you were um, uh, to engage in um, if you desired, and that revolved around your own personal advocacy action plan. What are, what are you desiring to do or able to do in this, right? What we want to talk about tonight, and, and we want to actually get to the mechanisms of this program. What have, what have you gained from this, right? Think about yourself at the end of May, right? All of this stuff is happening. Where were you? What were you thinking compared to where you are now and what you're thinking now, right? And then where do you want to be in relation to where you are now? Maybe you don't know, that's okay. That's an okay answer. Right? Maybe you need to better understand the mechanisms of education, right? Housing, uh, you know, civic organizations. What, what is that? Right? Maybe you need to understand that more. What is that that you need? How is it best provided to you? Who do you need to hear from? Right? Um, do you need to hear from an expert, a, a mom, a, a dad, somebody who? has your same outlook, like what is the best way of connecting you with that information? Um, and then like, you know, when, when are you best, when is the best time to have this kind of conversation? When are you most open to this conversation? And when are we more able uh, and likely to engage your participation? Um, any questions on what, what those questions are and, and how, what they mean in this conversation? Okay, so again, as always, the goal is to have authentic, open dialogue. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna break you up into groups, uh, groups of five, um, be open, chat, or four or five, open, chat, uh, answer the questions uh, as honestly as possible. And uh, let's hope that we can develop something meaningful here. Um, if this isn't it, if this isn't what you think is the solution, I would love to understand and hear what you think the solution is and why you don't think this is it. But the goal is to engage our communities meaningfully uh, in this dialogue. <clears throat> Anything before we break up? Maybe you could say break out instead of break up, Thomas. Break out. I, I was actually feeling That's like, right. but I don't, I'm not ready to break up. I, it just kind of so hurt my heart a little. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Break out because I will bring us back together just to make sure your heart is hold on before you, you're in <laughs> uh grandma and grandpa are here so they're kind of they're, they're they're kind of enjoying baby girl right now they're giving my wife a, a mental break while i'm stuck in the office <laughs> and uh you know can't support her for the evening yeah they do kind of get dibs they they put in a bit uh, of work in getting getting us here <laughs> Hey, Jason, stop. You're not allowed to talk about the baby before breakout because then people leave. That, that's, our motive. <laughs> that's our motive to make us stay. If you want updates on Jason's baby, then we'll talk about it after the breakout session. Did uh, we ever is. tell Jason that we kept his photo uh, or her photo hostage? 
No, but we'll, we'll talk about our strategic planning around little Naomi later. <laughs> I'm, I'm so confused. What just happened? <laughs> we'll talk about it. Uh, you know, I was going to say that I could possibly text pictures uh, to be shared later, but now I'm finding out they're being held hostage. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I thought it's, I had a family and a community here. It's the only way we can ensure that people stick around to the end of the program is if they know they're going to see your baby. Ah, they get a picture <laughs> afterwards. That's the hostage it was held. Yeah, we get a lot of people that cut out. <laughs> but obviously not these people. These are the faithful few. 